Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to this week's version of WSBA's Crypto Roundup. Your host, Ron Carranza, with my co-host, the one, the only, Joshua Ashley Clayman. Uh, before we begin, the usual stuff, Josh, please, everyone watching, keep in mind, nothing discussed is accounting, investment, legal, or tax advice. And very happy that today's uh, episode is brought to us by WSBA member firm Texture Capital. Texture Capital, the blockchain-powered marketplace for digital securities. Shout out to our friend Richard Johnson, CEO, and the great team over there. Learn more at www.texture.capital. That's T-E-X-T-U-R-E dot capital. Josh, happy Friday. Lots going on. Our poor friend David Grill, a bit under the weather. He'll be back with us next week. Um, but every week's a busy week, Josh. What's going on in your world? So I think one of the things maybe we can start with started with the beginning of the week. What was due on Monday? Well, the responses to the SEC's proposed safeguarding rule. And boy, were there a lot of responses. Um, I will say. Um, Including and, ours. And, exactly. I was just going to say that. So the WSBA submitted a response, um, which hasn't been posted yet. It, it appears that there's some kind of a, a backlog. So everyone keep, you know, stay, stay tuned for for this and more, because lots of others haven't been posted either. As well as, you know, in addition to the WSBA response, there were also some by other member firms, um, including, I believe there was one from Cahill with Galaxy, right? There was one um, that went up just today, although submitted previously from Multicoin um, yeah. Capital and Link Leaders had one. So I'm sure there's many others that I, I haven't mentioned, but I will say, you know, there's an article, if, if people haven't seen it, um, Nick Day from Coindesk yep. wrote, I'm sorry, Jesse Hamilton, excuse me, from, from Coindesk. We all know Nick. We just throw his name out there. <laughs> exactly. I use his name in vain way too much. But um, yeah, so there's an article and it says SEC blasted on custody proposal by JP Morgan, crypto firms and a fellow agency. And one of the really interesting things I thought about this article, which is true. And I think as we see more and more responses slowly get posted, um, it'll be really interesting to see who else responds. But what the article pointed out is that a lot of the people responding don't necessarily agree with one another on a lot of things. Yeah. And yet there were loud objections from from organizations that you know sometimes might have a different view from the SEC. And that includes um, the Small Business Administration. Uh, they had a, a very strong comment. JP Morgan and others have provided comment letters. I'm just looking through the article just to call out a few others. Um, SIFMA called the uh, the proposed safeguarding rule jurisdictional overreach, resulting in indirect and inappropriate regulation. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and much more, including, you know, okay, BACT provided a, a response and even the New York DFS weighed in and they yes. pointed out that in the absence of similar federal oversight, its system for regulating trust companies that specialize in crypto is, in its view, the best way to ensure that they'd be safe custodians. So I don't know, Ron, what do you think? I, you know, it, look, it, it's an interesting conversation when you see so many different organizations on different sides of a particular topic calling out bad proposed regulation for what it is, which is bad proposed regulations. One of the things that I had read many times that really resonated uh, in addition to the work that, you know, Josh, you and I in the group uh, within WSBA and members did for our submission was the fact that so little economic analysis had seemed to be done on this. And the overall proposal was almost 500 pages long. So when you think about the economic impacts and let, you know, and to be clear, it's not just crypto related, right? I mean, when we talk about safeguarding uh, client advisory assets uh, within the proposed rulemaking, that's a pretty broad industry segment being impacted by this, including those organizations that would potentially be involved in crypto. Look, we, we're hopeful. Hopefully the SEC at least at a minimum extends the commentary period. And I would argue, and Josh, you probably remember better than I do, I this might be the first proposed rulemaking that would be impact the crypto industry where so many TradFi organizations and banks and providers in this space weighed in almost not siding with the crypto space, but siding that this is a bad proposal. I think I'd never seen it to that extent for crypto relevant proposed rulemaking. I mean, so I don't know for comparison purposes, like I haven't done a, a measurement of that, but yeah. I would say, I mean, if you think about what the proposed safeguarding rule does, I mean, without going into all the things it does, sure. but it, it's, it extends the concept of, you know, customer assets that are 
that are securities or funds needing mm -hmm. to be held by a qualified custodian yep. to all customer assets. So you can understand why many different, I mean, there were responses um, by the LSTA and others, you know, for asset classes that have have little or nothing to do with, with digital assets. But I think one of the things is it's putting a lot of pressure on investment advisors, obviously, but also on qualified custodians. And I think what we've seen, at least within the digital asset space, arguably, is that many believe, and I think that there are, are reasons potentially for believing this, that some of the qualified custodians, um, such as banks, either may be quietly being suggested not to be involved with custodying digital assets or, or transacting is this digital assets. debanking, Josh? Or, are we going down the debanking road? So, I mean... It, a little a little bit although yeah. i i think of it more as like um yeah just getting the approval to transact with in digital asset rela related activities but then also if you look at um for example uh sab 121 right the accounting yes. rule yep. and that could have a big effect so if you're thinking of a massive amount of additional assets being squeezed to a flat or potentially for digital assets shrinking number of digital asset um, qualified custodians, yeah. you know, it, it seems challenging. Also, we saw, um, and this was reported as well, this was reported by Nick Day, um, was that Gary Gensler had come out uh, just the other, just last week, I believe, and said something like a qualified custodian, you know, just because someone says they are, doesn't mean they are, and was suggesting that many trading platforms may not be qualified custodians. Yeah, and it's interesting because this conversation we have frequently, Josh, right? When you look at the SEC's proposed rulemaking, and none of this is commentary about the commissioner or the chair or anything like that, there really does seem to be contradictory perspectives. And you, know, you could almost understand um, the crypto industry perspective that, look, you're trying to debank us, you're trying to just basically kick us offshore. The qualified custodian issue is really a great example because if the idea is that the only thing that can be qualified custodians are banks, but on the other side of that, SAB 121 makes it literally monetarily impossible for banks to custody crypto. What is the upshot? And that goes back to the comment earlier around, has anyone done a true economic analysis of this? Has anyone really within the, within the organization? I'm sure the SEC spent a lot of resources putting a almost 500 page proposed rulemaking together. But um, did they talk to banks? Did they talk to other providers in this space? Did they talk to the other trade associations that are even more deeply involved from the traditional TradFi world. That's the question I think a lot of participants in this space have. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the SEC did, but I, but I do. And while there are other types of entities that may be qualified custodians, right? Like the SEC talks about the limited number um, that exist for digital assets right now. Um, I, I think, you know, even to the extent that there are cost estimates, I don't know that it can properly take into account right now. You know, the impact of not just uh, rulemaking, you know, parallel rulemaking that's going on, parallel enforcement actions, right, potentially could be against custodians and others and just what impact that will have, as well as, you know, these proclamations or statements by various regulators. Um, and and how, again, the, the change in supply and demand for the services of those qualified custodians, how that's going to change. Because, you know what, that can result in, I mean, one concern we have is, that you know, it's going to either make things very expensive, like the qualified custodians that are willing to take the risks mm -hmm. for digital assets, going to have very high fees that are then potentially passed on to um, investors and customers, right? Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, that many of them may just shy away from it entirely. And so it's kind of the law of unintended consequences, as one of my colleagues um, kind of characterized it, because. In a in effort, you know, we saw what happened with FTX, and and many have said, oh, maybe there would be a different result had had those assets not been held at FTX or you know various other other things, and had been held by a qualified custodian. At the same time, if what ends up happening is that people don't have qualified custodians, right, and investment advisors, if they're required to use qualified custodians for all digital assets, including, yeah. for example, Bitcoin that maybe, you know, investment advisors don't continue to provide advice in that area. And maybe rather than um, making the industry safer for investors, you know, it's all put on them 
and yeah. and more risky. Josh, I ha we have this long running joke, you and I, with David, who unfortunately couldn't be here, that every time we do our, our crypto roundup, BTC takes a hit. When I started this morning, BTC was down 10% on the week. It's over. Uh, it's approaching an 11.5% on the week. So I hope there's no correlation there. We're getting some comments in. And thank you, everyone in the audience who joined us. I'm going to push back a little bit on, on Court, who's uh, and thank you for the comment, Court. It's a safe assumption many of these folks don't want much regulation due to the vast amount of market manipulation. I'll push back a little bit on that, although I do see the perspective. And Josh, I'd love you to weigh in here, too. But we're also talking about organizations that have approached regulators for years, requiring looking for clear roadmaps, look, looking for an understanding of what's the best way to approach this. So are, do you agree with that perspective? Or is it, you know, I, I we try very hard to push back on this. Everything in crypto is illicit. Everyone involved, you know, you saw a congressman basically say uh, Robert Kennedy, who you might have your own issues with Robert Kennedy is speaking at a Miami conference on Bitcoin and the conference is entirely designed for tax evasion, which is a pretty broad paintbrush to paint with. Do you agree with that perspective, Josh? So, no, I, I don't agree that everyone or that most people are you know, trying to to do something bad. Some people, I'm sure, are trying to do sure. something. Bad. But I think many people are looking to comply. I think one of just the practical challenges is right now, even if if you're have if some folks are serving as custodians, yep. even if they wouldn't meet the qualification of a qualified custodian at this point, is the alternative if this is adopted? Does that mean that people will not be able to use those types of custodians at all? Right? Will people be required to self custody? Which let me just say that there is definitely a place for self custody, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, to the extent that retail and other purchasers, without really depth of knowledge about the market, you know, uh, not necessarily being adept with the technology, how to buy, sell, hold, you know being more susceptible potentially to fraud and risks. I yeah. think with a lot of that, um, Commissioner Peirce in her in her dissent, when um, when this uh, proposed safekeeping rule was introduced, she touched upon a bunch of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, and Commissioner Peirce uh, really has a smart perspective on a lot of this. Obviously, we're, I'm, I'm a little biased on that. And my these do not represent the views of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance or the board. Um, but, you know, it, it brings me back to, yeah, which, of which you sit on, but it does bring me back to something that uh, the commissioner proposed a long time ago, which was a safe harbor. I wonder how much of the issues that we've seen uh, in the past couple of years might have been avoided or at least mitigated if there were a, a proper safe harbor put in place. And I don't even know what that would look like, particularly. Um, you know, Josh, to, just to pivot a little bit, one thing we didn't even talk about in prep that I wanted to throw out there as well, and it was really quietly covered, I would argue, if you remember a couple of weeks back, uh, Coinbase submitted a writ of man mandamus or mandamus, depending on which lawyer you talk to, uh, as related to their engagement and involvement with the SEC. And a court noted that the SEC has 10 business days to respond. And I think that 10 business day deadline is Monday. Have you seen this or do you have any perspectives on how they'll respond or if they'll respond? Can they appeal that? Do you know? So I'm not a litigator. Yes. So that's probably not a good question for me. I wish David were here, although I'm not sure that he's a litigator either. He's but not. What I would say is it. I haven't done the counting of the exact number of days or when it expires, but I believe you. And certainly they need to give some kind of a, a response, right? Some kind of a justification. I think what we've heard in other contexts, um, including there was a Laura Shin podcast that yep. focused on this where somebody, I, his name is escaping me at the moment. I feel like it's J.P. Veray, maybe? I might be butchering no, that, um, but or I might be also mispronouncing that, which would not be the first time. But basically he was saying like, look, this is this is deep chess, you know, and depending on how the SEC responds, if they give a quick no or, you know, we're just, you know, we're just not going to do it, then, you know, maybe in the future that can be used by Coinbase as part of their strategy um, in the event of an enforcement action, just saying like, look, we've continued to request rulemaking. We've shown for, for well, look, a long time, um, including through that really comprehensive rulemaking proposal that they proposed, I believe, last July, yep. July of 2022, where they asked a lot of questions and didn't get a response. So I think if I were the SEC, again, not being a litigator, but I would I would really think about, I would think carefully about my response and what the the downstream effects may be. I do think it's, it's interesting. We one thing that had popped up yesterday was um, this U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Yes. The the 
um, amicus brief that they filed in support of Coinbase. Do you, what are your thoughts about that, Ron? Well, I, I, you know, it goes back to the point we made a bit earlier. Um, you know, I'm doing a comparison, but for the advisory rule, we were talking about so many different organizations. For the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a not insubstantial organization with a very long history to weigh in the way they did and use the wording in that amicus that they did. I mean, at one point, and I haven't read the whole thing, full disclosure, they literally state that it looks like the SEC's behavior vis-a-vis -vis Coinbase has been unlawful. And that's not a word to be taken lightly. So I wonder what this does from the perspective of the SEC and the commissioners there. I wonder what this does from the perspective of the court. Does this change um, the perspective of the courts? Because for a long time, it's been crypto organizations are pushing back and they're going to court to do it, right? It, it, across the spectrum of different types of, of organizations. This is the United States Chamber of Commerce, pretty deep and broad sway within Washington. What does that do from a judicial perspective? Does that change the court's mindset on how important this is to be addressed properly? I'd I, I can't wait to see how the court approaches this. Yeah, I'm really excited as well. I mean, what I would say is we have to remember courts are made up of people. And certainly while there might, you know, arguments, no matter who, who makes them, may be valid or may not be valid or may be strong or may be weak, I definitely think that to the extent that there are folks from across across disciplines, across industries, um, and not just in the digital asset space, who are are expressing this, I think that that is um, it potentially is you know impactful in a different way, right? Um, because again, the people reading this, the people making the decisions, are people, right? So. I mean, and we don't, you know, it might be a bridge too far that, to say that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is now suddenly, you know, gung ho crypto uh, as a trade body, but it is it is telling in my mind that they came to this kind of defense of Coinbase, or or, or at least yeah. how the SEC approached Coinbase and the work Coinbase has tried to do um, over time to be quote unquote compliant. Full disclosure, Josh, as you know, Coinbase is not a member of the WSBA, uh, so I'm just basing all of this off of, of publicly available information. Yes. I mean, and same here. I, I think definitely what I would say is it, what's interesting to me also is I think the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, again, I haven't read this that closely either, but when they're talking about, OK, there's a one trillion dollar digital asset economy, that's that's the number that they give. Yeah. And and basically they say, like, this does not allow businesses to do business. Right. Like not just digital asset businesses, but really the whole the whole scope of of the business world. And so. I, I think that the fact that they say the FCC's delay is causing great economic harm, right, they say. In the business community, they need certainty for this, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe what they're getting at in part, although I I'm speculating, purely speculating yep. here. It's just that aside from digital native companies, there's a lot of other businesses, large yeah. businesses, small businesses who either have touched digital assets, plan to touch digital assets, would like to touch digital assets, and they just don't know the right path forward. And if you're, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, we've seen that, you know, in the news recently, Venmo, I think recently announced about a week ago that they'll be enabling um, crypto transfers, I think it was. And again, I should have that in front of me, but I don't. So again, this is not just crypto companies, it's the broader financial markets within the United States. Yeah. And I think, especially to the extent that you ha may have um, public companies, other companies, you know, just they may feel that they are because they're already regulated by the SEC, right? Because yeah. if they're public, that the scrutiny that they face, that they're the first line to be attacked against potentially, and yet they don't necessarily know what they can do, what they should do, and where the lines are. I mean, I will say this in my view, and I think my view has been very, you know, You've been very public about your view. Yeah, I mean, I I think certain things are clear. I think if you capital raise, if you fundraise sure. using a token, and you're going to use that those funds to build out the token, build out the ecosystem, yep. build out the, a blockchain. I think the regulator, the SEC, has been clear of their view of that, right? Now, whether a court shares that view is a different story, but I, I think that that part is pretty clear. But I agree that there are areas um, where we don't have 
we don't have information. And I think one of the, the big ones, sorry, Ron. No, 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 go for it. And I, I, I'm not shy in saying this, is that we need to know what the SEC's plan is going to be with respect to the tokens that in its view were illegally issued securities. Okay, if they wow. allegedly were, okay, so what does this mean? Is there, will they be grandfathered onto platforms or will no one in the US be able to touch them, right? Yeah. Once if, if, you know, if they would need to be traded on an ATS, but an ATS, for example, couldn't do its due diligence, yeah. right? And I think when we think about the larger business community, if they're trying to figure out whether they should somehow integrate a particular token with their business or a particular blockchain, you know, knowing whether a token, you know, is going to actually be, you know, what will happen to it. I think that is, that is a very important um, yeah. You, look, you, you, you and I have been in the crypto space for, for quite some time. And I, I always get the sense talking in my own personal capacity that the SEC acts like no one learned the lessons of the ICO era which was a nightmare of potentially unregistered securities being issued. And I agree with you. And I don't think anyone sober minded within our organization or the organizations we operate in don't think that those are considered securities, but there's the lack of clarity on some of the other stuff that, that makes it difficult. Josh, I want to be cognizant of time. One more shout out to our friends, uh, just as a reminder, today's episode is sponsored by WSBA member Texture Capital. Texture Capital, the blockchain powered marketplace for digital securities. Learn more at texture.capital. Josh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because recently you were in DC. And one of the things we uh, we talked about a little bit earlier on today was the joint house hearing um, really wide perspectives across different industry participants. What did you see there? What were your thoughts about it? I did watch it, but not all of it uh, as exciting as congressional hearings are, but I'd love your thoughts. So I had an almost front row seat <laughs> to watch it um, in DC. It was historic for those who weren't aware. The um, the representatives continually were saying that it was a historic meeting because it was joint. It was a joint meeting of the House Financial Services and Ag Committees, right? If you think about securities and commodities, yeah. right? Those, you know, coming together. And usually those meetings, as I understand them, the hearings are not joint. And I believe it was also historic in that it was in the Ways and Means uh, room just for, for purposes of, um, of size. Yeah. But yeah, we saw a big divide. You had some people saying this is this is about regulation. We are here to talk about regulation. And we had other people saying this is not about regulation. Um, and we also, um, you know, I, I think it was a great showing by the witnesses um, who yeah. were who were there. They included um, the head of Republic, the head of Republic Crypto from Republic. Um, also, well, I'll just say the names. Mr. Andrew Durgy, head of Republic, Crypto Republic. Mr. Matthew Culkin um, from Wilmer Cutler. And he was the former director of the CFTC Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight. Yep. Marco Santori was there. He's the chief legal officer for Kraken. Um, Daniel Schoenberger, who's the chief legal officer for Web3 Foundation. Uh, Tim Saad, who's a research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. And um, former CFTC chair. Exactly. I was going to get to that. I'm just reading. Sorry. <laughs> and then Michael Blaugrand, who's the COO at the New York Stock Exchange. So there were a lot of different views on the panel. Um, but also, I would say some of those statements were really a bit shocking uh, from some of the representatives. I mean, there was one analogy that crypto cryptocurrency means hidden money which I, I actually thought was a little catchy but um, but it, it, it's a good political byline but it's yeah. not you know particularly well informed and i think another thing that was that was shocking to my ears a bit was when um, one of the representatives had mentioned well you know the us is falling behind in black market organ you know deals. And so, you know, why should we be concerned if we're falling behind um, in digital assets? That's a paraphrase, but it yep. was, it was pretty shocking. So I, I definitely think obviously there are differences in political views, but it did seem that there was an overarching view to try and find a way to make things clearer. Now, some people yep. believe that the existing laws are the existing securities laws are sufficient and then others strongly seem to believe that they were not. Josh, so. I got to ask because we have this conversation regularly. And just a shout out to Gail, who's watching. Thanks for, for chiming in. She's noted that transparency is paramount for business in any industry. Gensler is totally opaque. In my personal capacity, I will say I agree. Um,
But Josh, you know, one of the things we talk about, uh, let's peel back the layers a little bit. And I, we can have really in-depth conversations about politicians and kind of the bluntly political theater that I think some of the commentary is. But what is it time to reinvent Howie? Is it time to evolve securities law in the United States? And I know that's been a drum that the crypto industry has banged on a lot. And I'm not sure if you're comfortable with that question. But I would argue as, an, as, a, as a business person, maybe that's something to think about in the future. So I, I understand that there's an appetite to, to consider or reconsider Howie. Yeah. Um, I, I do think we just have to remember that whatever we do with that test, it has effects not just in the digital asset space. And I think that's what the SEC would probably remind us just in general about exceptions, exemptions sure. and the like, is that you have to think about it broadly. I do think people are looking at a variety of different possibilities. I mean, I think some people are still thinking about things, um, components of, say, the, the Lummis Gillibrand bill and how those might be able to be built back in. Um, I think also, you know, one of the things that has been proposed, at least in some of the written testimony, my recollection is, for the hearing, was the idea of taking the SEC's framework from April 2019 and using that as a basis potentially to create law, right? Because that has a standard that the SEC has talked about mm -hmm. and maybe taking aspects of that and making them more formal. So if if there were, say, say it were, I know there's a lot of differences of opinion, so I'll be sensitive here. <laughs> I know that some believe that there is an investment contract wrapper and that a digital asset um, should never itself, unless it has separate indicia of being a security, but just by virtue yep. of being part of an investment contract, the token should be separate. Yep. I understand that the SEC's view is different um, in my understanding is that they actually believe that the token itself is representing the investment contract, at least for a period of time, but really trying to operationalize and understand yeah. when um, when something may be reclassified and have it be law as opposed to a, a you know, non-binding framework. I think that may be good. I also heard um, there another thing, since you mentioned this earlier about Hester Peirce's safe harbor, you know, that got some airtime as well, because sure. I believe that Marco Santori had said something like it would be light years ahead of where we are now. But yeah. a lot of distinctions were drawn, I would say, and maybe not not exactly parallels or exactly analogous, but a lot of time was spent using the New York Stock Exchange kind of as a foil <laughs> to compare against yeah. the trading platforms. But and you got to so imagine, do, would you imagine that the, the commission actually has any appetite to address the framework from prior to the current chair's position? I know that's 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 hypothesizing, right? That's that's kind of like we can't make any specific judgment there, but I, I can imagine them picking up the framework and using it as a basis for new regulations. I mean the well the framework itself isn't law, right? It says yeah. right at the bottom like it's just staff views, but they do apply it. I mean in my experience, yeah. we've had, you know, a token that, you know, we took through a process and you know, are comfortable that it came out the other side. Yep. And having that, though, be operationalized in such a way that if that is the position that people take, okay, so big if, if that's the one that lawmakers take, that we know how something happens, that we know when something happens, um, and that there's some kind of standardization. Similar to, you know, if you think about Hester Peirce's uh, framework, Commissioner Purse's framework, it works the other way, right? Rather than starting as a right. security, you start with a safe harbor and then have a three-year um, a three-year process. But I think, um, I don't know, I, I thought it was really exciting to be there. There was a great energy and I'm, I'm excited about it. But Ron, what about you? What are you excited I'm, about this week? I'm excited about a couple of things, not least of which is the fact that we're getting comments uh, in into our session. <laughs> The Tawan, my, my an old friend, uh, he asked, how about setting up a separate agency for digital assets? I'm not a politician. I don't live in Washington. I've got to imagine there's almost zero interest in the government creating a brand new regulatory agency, particularly when you've got the SEC saying they, they have jurisdiction over everything. Greg makes a really important point as well, uh, that there was a separate SRO was mentioned at the hearing. And I think it was mentioned by former Commissioner uh, Mossad of CFTC. I, I see the point of that. And we know other organizations are working on potential SROs. You know, all of us coming out of financial markets, Josh, and I'd love your opinion on this. I, what I'm excited about is that possibility. But the truth is, an SRO is a heavy lift. And it takes a lot of engagement in Washington. And it takes a lot of engagement with really big industry participants that I'm not sure are particularly interested in that right now. 
Um, the other thing I'm, I don't know if excited is the right word. I'm a little concerned. Um, kind of these meme coins popping up again, and I don't own any of them. None of this is investment advice, and I don't have Pepe coin that I think went to really ridiculous heights and then kind of collapsed a little bit. I'm just a little concerned that this is going to end up being more bad marketing for the crypto ecosystem, considering there's so much really important work that's happening. Because the first thing politicians and, and the news will point to is, oh, look, another token mania that's causing people to lose money. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. We're doing a lot of investigations on this side around why some of that demand is there. Really spending some time looking at why is BTC down 10% and it can't be since you and I went on air, Josh. But what are you looking forward to next week? Wow, next week. It feels <laughs> far away. Or over the weekend. <laughs> you know, I am looking forward, as you mentioned, if, assuming that the expiration is actually... Um, Monday. Yep. Week, yeah, is um, just finding out, you know, what the SEC says about the um, the writ. So that's one thing. Another thing I'm I'm excited about is um, Bitcoin Miami. Are uh, you going next week? Well, I'm going to Miami. I'm not necessarily going to Bitcoin Miami, but I will be having some um, some meetings around that time. Uh, so hi everyone, if if you might be down there. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of members joining uh, in Miami. I will not be there, uh, unfortunately, but if anyone's watching and is interested in meeting up with some of the WSBA members, drop us a note, info at wsba.co. Happy to connect you all. Josh, we're a little bit over time. Always a great conversation. David will be back next week. I'm sure it'll be a very boring week in the crypto world to talk about. Probably not, but we'll leave it there. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.